Right, so welcome to our mobile CSP webinar for the month of October. Tonight's webinar is on cool activities for the classroom that can be done in addition to or in lieu of some of the activities that we have already in the mobile CSP curriculum. Um, so tonight um, I am leading this webinar with one of our master teachers. And, uh-oh, my name, if you don't know, is Pauline Lake. I'm the curriculum and PD coordinator for the National Center for Computer Science Education. I work um, primarily on mobile CSP and also now the CS Awesome programs. I'm joined tonight by one of our master teachers for mobile CSP, Lisa. Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lisa Fran. I'm uh, working for Virginia Beach City Public Schools and I'm a master teacher for mobile CSP as well as for CS Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. All right, so tonight, um, this is the first slide, right, Lisa? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, tonight it's primarily going to be mostly Lisa sharing some of the activities that she's done in her classroom. Um, I will share some ideas at the end that have come from um, other teachers that I've worked with over the years. I've worked with Mobile CSP since its inception, and um, there's been a couple cool, really cool projects that have stood out to me um, from working with teachers and students over the years. Um, so Lisa's actually going to go first, um, and if there's anybody currently watching the webinar and joining in with us, feel free to put questions in the chat, and then I will re relay them to Lisa as we go. So Lisa, I'm going to kick it over to you. Okay, sounds good. All right, the first activity I have here, I like to do when I introduce binary numbers. Um, there are six cards here. They are labeled A through F. And basically, I tell the kids, you know, pick a number between 1 and 47. And then I tell them not to tell me their number, although some of them do blurt it out and we have to start again. But just tell me the card that the number appears on. So, for example, if a student was to tell me that their number appeared strictly on ca um, card C and card D, I would be be able to tell them that their number was 12 or if they told me it was on just card A and card F I would be able to tell them it was 33 and what's happened here is these cards have been made so that the place values for the ones and the zeros if there was a 1 in the 32's place value for a binary number you would see um, that number on card A. If the card has a 1 in the 16's place value for a binary number chart that number would be on card B, et cetera. So I have a link in the slides that you can download these cards, but I'm also going to go to the next screen. And, oh, yep, there we go. And show you what I do is I put them on the board, and I put like four or five sets of them around the room so the kids can kind of see them. And I don't do this part at first. I simply just ask them which card it's on, and then I magically tell them, and they tell me, oh, I memorized it. And I always tell them I'm impressed. They think I'm that smart, but no. And then I start showing them by lining them up, and I've got my place values lined right up there, that if you put a check mark in B, C, and E, that they're their number would have to be 26 because that's where the ones would appear as far as place value go and zeros and the others. So I tried to like just throw um, three examples up there and snap a picture so you guys could kind of see how once you've played the activity with them and they, they really get a kick out of that, that you can then transition into that. The other thing I do with binary is on the next screen. Okay. Um, I have, um, under the manipulative link, I have a document where you can print this pink paper that I have here. And in the left uh, picture, you can see where I've written a binary number. And this paper manipulative, I should have put a fold, uh, flat folded one out, I guess. But um, you cut it out, and it has all the directions on it that you um, cut the dotted lines um, versus the solid lines, and you fold and you write zeros and ones so that once you have a number at the top, like the number that I've written there, they can copy it using the little paper manipulative, and then when they unfold the ones to look at the place values, it shows me that I have a one in the 64, 32, four and twos place value, and then shows them how they can add that up to find the actual uh, base 10 number. Um, it's kind of funny, my kids really like this, and I remember I had one kid wanted to take the assessment with it, and I told him that no, unfortunately he couldn't, but it, it's kind of funny how they like some of these little manipulatives. So both of those are for binary. 
And um, sometimes I do both in like one, one, one day kind of to lead in where we're heading and then the other the next day. And sometimes I'm on the same day. So those are two of the um, two binary activities I have. The next activity that I have actually going to pause you for a second, Lisa. Sure, sure. Um, so I believe this is Lindy. Hi, Lindy. Um, she said, Lisa, the cards work great to introduce binary. Do you have a game or unplug to help with hexadecimal? No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's a harder one to work with. Um, I'll, I, I remember this activity. I can't really take credit for it. I remember somebody showing it to me years ago as an enrichment activity when I taught middle school math. And then when I got ready to teach binary, um, it struck me and I had, so I recreated the, um, the cards, but I'll keep thinking. And if I come up with something, I'll post it to the group uh, um, site. All right. And I would just add that um, I'm, I probably bring it up later um, in the slides that I posted in the chat that you should have access to. Um, and I can post that, that link again. Um, I do have a reference in there that I will mention and hopefully get to tonight about a hexadecimal scavenger hunt activity. So that information is in there that might be something of use to you. All right, Lisa, next slide, right? Uh, yes, I can remember what's next. Oh, the cryptography hunt. This one I created last year, and I do have a link, I think, on the next screen to what I have. And it's there might be like a couple mistakes. So you got to really work through this one because this one was a really hard one to build, but the kids loved it. So um, basically, here's kind of the directions there. Um, each kid will get a, a document that has a um, paragraph that is in transposition encryption and they have to decrypt their paragraph and once they decrypt their paragraph and show me that it's decrypted I will tell them a number which is which word they're to use as their password for the next clue and a location so I I enlist many different people in our building and the the more um the people in the building are willing to get into it the more fun it becomes because last year I had this awesome lady that would not let them have their pat their next clue unless they would call her the key master so it was really funny and she was hysterical but once they have their first one they go to that particular location whoever the key master is there the end of it the I put them in groups of three they have to tell the key master their plain text word which is their password and then the, the key master will give them their next cipher text and then on the little card which is going to be on the next screen they have this their um, in all the information they need in order to decipher it and then so that they can keep going through and I set it up so that they and there are five that they have to do after the main paragraph that the last one they all go back to the same spot which is where I'm at and I always make sure I have a treasure for everybody the first group there does get a little bit bigger bag of candy but everybody gets the candy in the long run so um, if you could go to the next screen please this is just an example of a little snippet. On the left in this screen, this is one of the first um, cards that is with one of the groups because every group has a different one. And of course, at the top where it says password, they would put the word from the paragraph, which happens to be hunt because on the right side I have the answer. And so now that they would go to whoever their key master is in their location, they would tell them hunt and then they would hand them this card that you see on the left and it tells them, what cipher algorithm to use and any keywords or shifts that they would need are listed there and then they're supposed to decrypt their cipher text there which when they get done decrypting that it will be giraffe because you notice it's on the other card because my answers are on the right hand side and once they have that decrypted then they have to go to location a now on the original paper with the paragraph that i give them i have all the locations listed and so they um they when they see location a here they just go to the table and they say okay location a might be room whatever or the office but that way i can move them depending on where I can find key masters for each bell. But that shows two of them. And I, if I remember correctly in the document, I think I had eight groups and each group had five different cards they had to work through. And nobody had the same word, the same um, cipher, like the same algorithm that they had to do in order. Cause I, and I did it that way so they couldn't just follow each other, that they all had to work independently and, and 
you know, basically be honest with it. But I, I know that was a lot of fun last year, watching them running up and down the halls trying to find stuff. So that, and like I said, there is a link to it. And I think the directions are pretty clear in and there. Um, but I feel like there's one word that might be wrong somewhere that I got to go back through, but I just hadn't found it. So, oh yeah, there's the whole document with the, um, the very original there where there's the, uh, the paragraph and they figure out, like I said, when they get that done, there's the directions. And then there's kind of the key that they have where you can tell them where all your locations are. And then from there, can you just scroll to the next page? This one page, just page two, please. Oops. This one page, I think they read down. So there's the top left, um, middle left, bottom left, then the top right, then the middle right would be the path that they would travel. In the bottom corner there, I have like what word number from the paragraph that group would get and um, what the password would be, but all the answers are there on each corner. And when I make them, I put them all on different color paper so that when they come back, they should have all the same colored paper um, clues that they're giving me that they've gotten through everything. So, and I use this at the end of the unit that has all the ciphers in it as a kind of review before we do our assessment. So I'm going to stop because I know I, I can be wordy. Are there any things I need to answer there? I see all those chats, but didn't get through them. Currently no additional okay. questions are coming in. Cool. So, and then I have one more activity in here. And Lisa, since we have some time here, oh. I wanna to try to see if I can just toss you over access will be a little bit easier so you can okay. control the pointer let's see if i can do that hmm. i guess i'm not seeing the the option okay that's odd i'm still sharing right I don't, well, I have something on my screen. I have, there's another window on top of the uh, the slides. The next one, there's not that much in it. So okay. I think I'm, I'm okay there. Okay. All right. And this last activity I have here, it, I call it life-size robot activity. From the pictures, I hope you can see, um, I have two pictures of students working. What I have on the ground is a clear shower curtain that I bought at the dollar store. And then I have 12 by 12 grids drawn off on the shower curtain. And then I cut 12 by 12 um, pieces of paper so that the kids could make, and I just put one example of a maze. They, the maze in the middle is the maze that they made. And so my young man started in the corner there and with his group of three, they're working on what the directions are to get the robot to move using their, they have their quick references. Well, I don't think it's called a quick reference, but they're reference sheets from the principals and they're walking them off and discussing them as they go. Um, and the only rule I have with them is that I ask them to please not wear their shoes on it because the plastic won't hold up well. Mine happens to be clear, but I think it could be done on a plain, like white or off-white one even. The other idea you could do is you could use um, painter's tape to tape off your grid on the floor. I just like the shower curtain because I can pick it up and move with it, and I don't have to worry about it like the uh, custodial staff might fuss about the tape on the floors. But my kids like this because they always call it, oh, we're gonna play Twister. I'm like, no, not exactly. So that's that's one of the things I know that they enjoy doing too. So those were the uh, activities that I brought. And um, Andrew says, human logo, exactly. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, let me just remind myself. Ah, okay. So I'm up next. So um, thank you, Lisa. No um, does anybody have any questions about Lisa's activities that she shared? Um, not seeing any questions coming in. Um, <clears throat> and my side just wanted to take a quick look about that. Yeah, so back on the cryptography hunt 
notes. Mm -hmm. um, that slide is where I put in the speaker notes the link to um, a binary hex. So let me see if I can see the notes. without messing this up. <laughs> so this is another activity that was shared by um, a mobile CSP teacher. And this was um, uh, in regards to hexadecimal, I believe, once it loads. Um, so this is by Audrey Coates. Um, from Mass Linfield Mass had shared this previously, I believe on the mobile CSP forum. So if you're on the teaching mobile CSP forum, we encourage you to share your ideas and your resources and activities out um, at any time, right? You don't have to wait for a webinar like this to share the ideas. Um, and then with permission, like if you give the mobile CSP team permission or you say, hey, Pauline, I'd like to add these to the resources, I can add them to the resources folder that we have on Google Drive with various shared materials from, um, from mobile CSP teachers over the years. Um, so this is one from, um, from Audrey that she had shared uh, that was in regards to binary and hexadecimal. I personally haven't done this one, um, but the link is there and it's in the, in the slides. Um, so it's an alternative to doing the cryptography hunt or in addition to, um, but you may want to do it a little bit sooner as you're introducing binary and hex at the start of the year, whereas cryptography would come at the end of the year with the later units. Um, so that's another option there. All right. So um, for me, let's see. <clears throat> So I'm check the chat. Then he says, I've used shower curtains. Um, she says, I have spheros in my room and they use a shower curtain sphero to break free. Pretty cool to combine with the robots. Awesome. All right. Here we go. All right, so uh, my turn, and feel free, Lisa, if you've done any of these to jump in, or anybody else, if you've done these um, to jump in. So over the years, working with the mobile CSP teachers, pixel art has been one of the ones that has stood out by far um, with students and teachers. I personally had done a variation of this in my classroom after seeing um, and visiting a school that did this activity. Um, it's really a way for the students to really get involved and be hands-on with their learning and they take such ownership of being able to do this. So this is related to the representing images lesson in unit three. So students start to learn about how images are made bit by bit and are learning about run length encoding, RLE. Um, this particular picture here um, is, I believe it's Eden Prairie in Minnesota. Um, with um, Jen and Jessica. Um, they did this activity and they have in the, the glass windows in their cafeteria and they give the students post-it notes and they have them recreate the, these photos um, pixel by pixel using the post-it notes. So um, that is the unplugged version of this, is being able to find a picture such as, you know, the Super um, Mario picture, being able to, to pick out which, um, which colors are there, what are each of the, what color is each bit, and recreating that with a post-it note. So that's the unplugged version. I put a link to Amazon that has, you know, you can find it, colors, different colors, post-it notes. Obviously the more colors, the more, um, the more creativity the students can do and the more range they have with the pictures that they can make. Um, so if you can find, um, really good, a really good pack of multicolor post-it notes. I think it really works out. Um, so that's the unplugged version and what you see here is an example of what they did in their school of the end product and it really decorates the school, right? And it gives the students a chance to be able to talk about and share with their friends who might not be in the class and say, hey, this is what I'm doing and what I'm learning about and it builds excitement around the course as well. 
<clears throat> um, the version that I've done um, was based off of a teacher in Connecticut that I worked with and I went into his classroom um, at Conard High School and I saw um, his students had taken images and they had recreated them but they were done um, with an editing software on the computer. So teaching students a new tool to use. Um, I put some suggestions in the slides. They can use Photoshop, but there are, are tools like GIMP that are for free that you can use. My students, when I had my students, I used the Piskel app, which is just an online free tool that they can use. And the idea is that you give them a 16 by 16 grid. You have them try to recreate their image um, cell by cell using the paint tool um, to recreate their image and then writing out the run length encoding that goes with that and you can take that as far as if they did the image in black and white you can do the zeros and ones but you can take it as far as um, in 3.3 the lesson actually goes into doing um, the RGB coding with run length encoding and teach them how to do that um, and use hexadecimal numbers too. So that's another way to get hexadecimal in there and have them writing out the run length encoding. With my students, I'd have them do recreate the grid for their picture, um, which whatever picture they would like, as long as it's appropriate, you get to learn a lot about the students and their interests um, by the pictures they choose. And then I would have them do the run length encoding have them print two copies of it, one that they would give to me and turn in as their assignment, and the other they would swap with another student, and the student would have to recreate the picture from the run length encoding. If the student that they swapped with came back and had the exact same picture, then the run length encoding was done correctly. If they had a weird mixed up, then obviously there was a mix up and the student would know, hey, I did something wrong when I did my run length encoding. Let's talk about it. Let's figure out how to get it um, fixed and done correctly. So it can turn into a great collaboration as well as they're practicing with that. Um, <clears throat> I'd love to hear others if you've done it in your class, how it's worked. Lisa, have you ever done this one? I have not. Well, I've done something similar in a very small scale, but with just black and white, um, but but not very not not to that scale. And it took me a while because I looked at this earlier today, and I just dawned on me the angle we're looking at, and that those are the cafeteria tables. I thought these were small pictures, and now I see they're massive. That is so yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, we did have somebody talk about paint chips too with the hex colors um, um, in the uh, chat. Somebody said it was Debbie said that she uses as a warm-up activity. She gets paint chips with hex codes and has students choose a color to represent their current mood and then they convert those numbers to binary and decimal. So that, that sounds like something cool. I might have to hit Home Depot and get some me get me some paint samples. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think like any type of, you know, just going beyond just having the, the math part, like the math and the numbers and really trying to make it a, a, applicable to the students is a right. great way to get them interested. Um, I, I, I'm, I want to say I'm surprised that this has been one over the years that has been a really, like, really exciting one for the students. But then again, I'm not. Like, again, it, it gets them show, like, their individuality and what they're interested in. It makes it hands-on and applicable to them. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a great activity to be able to share with, you know, what you're doing with other students in the school as well. Of course, you don't have to go as far as doing giant ones in the cafeteria, um, <laughs> but um, you, know, you can put them around school, in your classroom, um, you can have them just, you know, in you know, students putting them on their lockers or something like that, you know, just a way for them to have some individuality and apply what they're learning in the class. All right, so I'm gonna go on. <clears throat> and just mention that one big activity coming up very very soon it'll be here in a couple of months is computer science education week just a quick plug um, many of you know that the hour of code came out in december of 2013 and that really was the start of being able to celebrate computer science education week which is the same week of grace hopper's birthday um, so this year it's december 9th the 15th if you go to csedweek.org you can sign up and get some cool ideas for what to do at your 
your school. Could be an hour of code. Um, I know that code.org used to send really cool resources out with posters and stickers. And if you go on and say, I'm going to do an activity for the hour of code, they'll send you a little packet that you can use with your students. Um, but there's also other things on the site too. Um, other ideas to be able to um, have other activities besides and going beyond just an hour of code. Um, I've seen schools do, you know, parent teacher nights during or offer parent student coding nights during the the week of computer science education week. Um, ways to get students telling other students what's going on, ways to get them sharing with their parents and letting parents know what's happening in their computer science classes. Um, and then on csedweek.org slash learn, there is also an entire list of activities that you can choose from for all grade levels. And just a plug that Mobile CSP actually has two activities that we have that are approved and put up on the site. So the very first one we did um, was created by Ralph Morelli, who started Mobile CSP. And that was a play that tune app and that gave students um, a chance to be able to make music on the piano and then be able to download their app at the end using App Inventor. Um, and now, um, just recently, Mobile CSP's Beryl Hoffman has uh, worked on the Map Tour app, which is available um, and, and, and there as a quick introduction. Map Tour, as you know, is also one of the lessons done in the Mobile CSP curriculum. So it gives students a chance to do it as a quick standalone activity if you're just introducing students who aren't taking your course, um, or you can have your students do, um, you know, do that tutorial as part of the week. Um, Pauline, can I pipe in for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I've done in my school for um, Computer Science Education Week is we do something in the library, and I'll send a group of kids down there to kind of help monitor with the students as they come in during different lunch shifts. And I made stickers. You know how when you go to vote and it says, I voted today? Um, I made stickers because it used to be that um, when you signed up, I used to get these packets that I coded today, and now I don't think they send them out. Um, so I made a whole bunch on um, address labels that say, you know, I coded, I did the hour of code or I coded today or something like that. And for more, and like I even put like on the little sticker at the bottom for more information, I tell them to come to room 109, which is my room, because that way I can also start getting kids to know what's going on in our building and let them know what, what classes I offer to help try and get them kind of funneling them in. But that sticker on their shirt, like I voted today, kind of gets them talking without them. And they're, it's kind of funny how high school kids are for stickers. So it's a thing now, the sticker things. <laughs> but yeah, so it's just a suggestion. Absolutely. And I think this is my last slide before we open it up. Um, just wanted to talk about some of their activities and things that are happening. Um, MobileCSP.org slash activities is where I try to keep a list of uh, outside activities that you can do with students and contests. Um, two big ones that are coming up is the Congressional App Challenge. So going beyond um, having students just submit apps in the class to you as a grade, but actually letting them connect their projects to something that's outside. Um, um, the Congressional App Challenge is a great way to do that, having them submit their apps and be judged by um, their local senator. Um, I've had in the past, or heard, sorry, in the past, um, there have been quite a few mobile CSP students that have won the Congressional App Challenge. Um, in the state of Connecticut, our local CSTA chapter actually celebrates now at the Capitol um, each year, the winners, and brings them together to celebrate that and promote computer science. Um, um, so it's a great way to have students um, go beyond just the classroom and, and if they would like to put extra work in and, and really be invested in the projects that they're doing, it's a great way to have them do that. Um, that is a group challenge. I believe you have to have a group of four, up to four, I believe it is. Um, 
uh, those of you who've actually done that, feel free to, to chime in at the end here with how your experiences went. Um, another big one that a lot of students from mobile CSP tend to get involved with, and it's for girls, is Technovation Challenge. It allows them to sort of work through a, a business plan and look at entrepreneurship, really taking the business side of their apps that they're creating. Um, and they actually get a mentor, a female mentor that works with them um, through that design process and really focusing a lot on the design itself before they get into building and marketing the app. Um, and then lastly, um, I'm just Diago. So um, Jennifer Rosado um, from the center and mobile CSP, um, she's been doing a phenomenal job of making sure that our profile is staying up to date. And one way you can use this is with what you're now seeing at the end of each unit, which used to have blown to bits. We're now calling it impacts of CS and we're trying to include um, other sources besides just the blown to bits book in um, relating those lessons back to how computer science is impacting society around us. And one way to do that is to do local um, and current events with students. So um, our profile with Diago is keeping track of some of the things that Jen has been seeing in the news um, that would might be helpful for um, your mobile CSP classes. Um, one thing I used to do personally when I taught the course is to actually have students tell me, you know, they'd be on the search and the hunt for local news articles. If they found one, they could discuss it with the class. I would give them time to do that and we would keep a, a file, a document that had links to all the lo um, recent news articles that we could find and had discussed. Um, that also helps with the explore task. When you're doing the explore task, they have to have recent sources and credible sources. So this is one way to try to not only teach about the impacts of CS and relate it back to the impacts, but also teach them about how to find credible and reliable sources when they're looking for information. So um, that is all that we have for you tonight. We would love to take this time to answer questions about the activities, um, but even more so to open it up, feel free to unmute yourself, chime in um, and let us know maybe an activity that you've done or if you've done one of the activities that we mentioned, tell us how it went. Um, this is an open space. Just know that we are recording this for those who did not attempt. We're quiet group tonight. <laughs> That's because everything's so well organized. Why, thank you, Mike. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, can I ask a question? I'm a new mobile CSP teacher. Can I ask something that's not related to an activity, but just a question? Um, I am trying to get pair programming going, and I'm wondering how people use that when there's videos to watch for the lessons. Do you use it for the extensions after they build the initial apps, like the map tour or things like that? How do you get that going and what works the best? So I'll, I'll, I'll hop in and say something real quick with the pair programming. When um, I actually have students that are going through and like, we're lucky we almost have a tablet for everybody, but we don't have a tablet for everybody yet. It's been a while, like we've been doing this for 
six or seven years now. Um, so we kind of look at the text version all together at the very beginning. And we have the videos there. We watch like the little primer to see what's going on. We kind of display it for the whole class on the projector. And then as we go through, like these are the highlights. I give them areas where they might trip up, where they might see things. And then it's kind of, you know, sit with your partner, see who's driving at the start and see who's kind of like running things. And then, I don't know, it just kind of goes from there where they kind of manage themselves with watching the videos if they need. And if they feel they need to switch, they switch. And if they feel that they kind of keep going, like I've always done like a parallel programming where they both have app inventor up and running, but one of them is driving the tablet and they kind of work with it that way. And they're leaning in and helping and pointing and leaning back over. And it's a real like community effort, but the, the video watching hasn't really been a thing because I'm not sure all my students go to the videos regularly if we're like discussing it in class like they use it as a I didn't get that one now let me go back and look at the video versus we're gonna be here now in the moment yeah I've started to move like I did videos for the first couple because I felt more comfortable doing that but I've been doing more I'll lead it and then I'll have them read the text so I have been trying that so when you say parallel programming they're both on their own apps and then they talk to each other is that what you mean or are they working on the same app together I'm I'm sorry I'm just I want to Yeah when I when I say like the the pair programming and like doing it in parallel they're both programming on their own login for App Inventor Got but it, they're okay. sharing like the hardware of the tablet that sits back and forth between their station and they're like Got oh it. let me log in real quick and let me let me scan my code let me test this thing out uh, it's not working on mine are you able to connect can you add this feature into your code and so a lot of times like we just have like you know Wi-Fi issues where they're upgrading our network now so sometimes like someone's computer will get kicked off of Wi-Fi and you've got to wait like two or three minutes for it will come back. And yeah, so I, um, I switched to, to mobile CSP. I was going to use something else um, and then I like this better. So I have really bad slow tablets, but I do have enough for every student. So I understand and sometimes some of ours aren't working correctly. Um, so yes, yeah, so you do more parallel programming and then you just kind of assign them someone who they would work with more than the driver navigator model where like one person's coding at a time. That, and I, and I do stress in the environment that like, you know, help out your neighbor because you have more got than it. just the person that's sitting to your immediate left and your immediate right. So you've got two people you can work with in, in my classroom. I got like rows of six where they're kind of yeah, the same. Yeah. And so they can always like lean in and help each other out and then feel free to like float from row to row if you have a really cool idea, a really cool solution, and you want to kind of share it and see what other people's ideas are. Okay. Um, so I will jump in and say um, my two cents on that is giving the students the text version, right, and trying to pair them up and say, okay, read through the text version, go through it, try to build it together. <clears throat> Having one person be the, the driver and one person be the navigator, with the navigator being the one who's doing the reading and following of the text version is helpful. Um, I think with the videos too, it could be that the navigator is the one watching the video and steering the driver in App Inventor as they work in App Inventor to, um, to complete and the blocks and make sense of what's happening with the blocks. But I can definitely see how it can be a challenge with the videos, right? It's easy, it may, a student may feel it's just easier for themselves to watch the video and follow along. Um, so I would advocate for when you're trying to do that, try to do it more so when you have the tutorials. Um, in some cases, making it that um, you, if you need to printing out what we now have are short handouts instead of those really long texts. Um, the uh, curriculum development team made some shorter handouts that it will be easier for printing and reproducing that you could give to the students and say, okay, the only thing you're going to have open is App Inventor, right? And you'll use just the printed text to guide you through. So that's another way to do that. Um, I did see Andrew said he's been doing some old style paper and pencil binary activities lately. Um, and then that prompted me to think that Lisa and I were talking about unplugged. And I know in the professional development that we talk about um, unplugged activities, but if there's anyone on here tonight that did not do the professional development with us or who does not know what unplugged is, um, I'm putting the link in the chat to the original CS unplugged 
unplugged activities and there's lots of resources in there lots of different binary activities that are paper and pencil activities that you can do as well to help reinforce learning binary with your students um, I think there's one coming up, I know we're not there yet, but it's time to start talking about it, right? Is Christmas is coming. Um, I think there's a Christmas tree one that's on there. Um, there's different holiday ones. Um, I think there's a, there's another one too that I'm thinking of. One of my favorite ones is for RLE with the representing images is the one where you um, pretend like you're learning how to, how a printer would print and you're penciling in pixel by pixel. So one of my favorite ones, I think the pictures that you make are actually really cute and the students respond to them really well. Um, and there's just a bunch of activities that you can do and print out with your students with those. Yeah, I just did the RLE activity like three days ago and it went really well. We awesome. just were kind of at that spot. And um, so that's what I'm going to try our next day of school. We have conference day tomorrow. But I, I felt like the short handout wasn't quite enough for my students. But I want, so I kind of made one in between and I'm going to try that. But that's good to hear that you feel like the text works better with the pair programming. Um, and just, yeah, that, that type of advice because I want to try it with them. Um, so I basically made it like in between the text version that has pretty much everything written for them. And then the one that's, I didn't know if they could do some of the map tour or the notifier when they hadn't used one before. So I gave a little bit more on that piece and stuff. So we'll see how it goes. Hopefully it goes well. <laughs> sure. Let us know. Send a message on the forum yeah. after it happens. Great. One thing I would suggest too, like with that unplugged book, like when you read through it, I always have one unplugged activity ready to go in case um, our school notoriously loses power once a year. And so when you're stuck with kids in a room and once we lose power, they won't let them move from class to class and you're stuck, you got to find something to do. <laughs> so some of those unplugged things are just nice just to pull out. Even if, even if it's not my mobile class, my mobile CSP class, some of my other classes, I'll pull anything out that's kind of unplugged like that just to kind of get them doing something rather than just looking at each other. So. Would anybody else like to share? I'll share one more thing. Um, I'm a math teacher. Have you guys seen Delta Math before? And their, um, their questions, they have really good ones just for practice for the um, computer science tests. And I've found some teachers in our area that um, don't necessarily teach math, don't know about it. Um, but it's called www.deltamath.com. And he is a math teacher from New York City, and he also teaches APCSP, and he has pseudocode, binary, RGB, um, logic, you know, logic gates and all that stuff there with um, randomly generated questions. Has anyone seen that before? I've never seen it, but I did jump over to the web page. Um, is, is it a free login when I start signing up there? Sorry about that, I was muted. Um, yeah, it's totally free. He's just oh. this amazing teacher from New York City that made this great product. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna check it out tomorrow during my planning bill, I'm, I'm bookmarking it now. Yeah, it's good for like test prep, but it also like has, it'll generate, you know, you can give the students like 10 binary questions and they all get their own question. Oh, um, really cool, yeah. And it'll show examples and you can give them a couple chances. It's, it's really nice, I mean, I, I feel fortunate because it's better than any other math programs we have that we pay for. So I use it for algebra too, but then I also was happy that he teaches APCSP too. And I did put the, the link in the chat, so thank you for sharing that. I also added it to the last slide of the PowerPoint presentation, or the Google Slides presentation, um, so we have it documented as well.
All right, we're gonna do one last call. Anybody else wanna share an activity that they have done in the class? Or do you have questions about any of the activities? All right, well, thank you all for joining us tonight. Special thank you to Lisa for sharing all of her wonderful activities with us. I encourage you to keep this conversation going, whether it be questions or resources that you would like to share on the Teaching Mobile CSP forum. Um, other than that, I hope that the school year is going well so far for each and every one of you. And I encourage you to also make sure that you're planning some type of CS um, Education Week activity, big or small. Any activity is a great activity to do and raise awareness. Um, thank you all again for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your night.